Bowen Lectures. And this year, we are welcoming uh, to the Bowen Lectures, Dr. Marilyn Hudson, who is, uh, this is, you know, she's retiring in May. I'm tempted to call this a swan song, but um, <clears throat> perhaps I shall not. I have started with her marking, you know, this is the last of these, and this is, this is the last Ash Wednesday service that you will do as a faculty member. This is the last, this committee meeting that you will do as a faculty member. Um, and so, no doubt, last Bowen lectures, you're not doing those again, are you? <laughs> um, as a faculty member at NPS. Dr. Hudson has been here for 35 years. She started as a child prodigy. And so it's, uh, that's why it is so young. I am, um, I, you know, I know Mary Lynn was incredibly nervous when I walked up to do the introduction, but I'm actually going to be nice. Um, uh, I am thinking right now of uh, her pastor, Cheryl Cornish, who once upon a time said of her that she is a sequoia in this forest. And that is true. Um, one of the rock solid, um, groundskeepers, holders, reachers to the sky, nourishing the land around, nourishing me in particular, um, been friend and colleague and partner in sometimes solutions and sometimes uh, mischief and um, um, sometimes in whining and sometimes in you know those things you do when you've worked together for a really, really long time. Mostly what I know about worship, I have learned from her. Um, I grew up in a, a tradition that didn't uh, spend a lot of time thinking about worship. And so most of what I know about worship, I have learned from Dr. Hudson. And this community, MTS, is immeasurably better because she has been a sequoia in this forest. So as um, among the last things that she offers the community are this year's Bowen Lectures, Dr. Hudson, we are glad. So. Thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. It's wonderful to have friendly faces sitting out there encouraging me to go on uh, to Jody Hill, our president, and to the very supportive dean that we have, Pete Gadke, and especially my colleagues who have entrusted me with these lectures. Uh, thank you. I'm humbled because I know that I stand in a long line of faculty members at Memphis Theological Seminary who have given these lectures, who have shared their remarkable research while teaching a full load. So I'm grateful. I'm also grateful to the Bowen family. I know something about the Bowen lectures. The Bowen family uh, remembered MTS in their will and left a farm uh, as part of their estate to MTS years and years ago. After we sold the farm, the proceeds of that went to fund this endowed lectureship. So I'm grateful to the Bowen family who had the forethought to remember this seminary in their will. It created an enduring legacy that funds theological research and writing. So I hope many of you will be inspired by their example and think about remembering MTS in your wills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to admit from the beginning the limitations of this study. The idea of lecturing on the changing world of worship is so huge, huge, that I have struggled over the months to try to figure out how to focus this lecture. 
And so um, I'm focusing down tonight to look at what it is about this culture that has changed so drastically in the last 50 years and how those changes have influenced three major worship styles that seem to dominate the, the world of worship now. Um, I admit that I am an older, educated white woman who has been involved in worship for all my life, even from the womb, uh, as a participant and also as a student. I have studied, but at the same time, I have not been immersed in all the worship styles I'm going to talk about tonight. So I want to say in advance that I'm really um, thinking of these as an observer who is observing and trying to um, understand more fully the importance of these worship styles um, on the church today. In the decade after I began teaching at MTS, the theologian Edward Farley at Vanderbilt wrote this little book called Deep Symbols, the Postmodern Effacement and Reclamation. When I first read this book, I was a little shaken by the sense of urgency that Farley projected through his words. But now, as I read the book nearly three decades later, I understand his concern because I have lived to watch these cultural changes play out in our time. In 1990, Farley claimed that a new cultural epoch had already dawned and that our traditional ways of knowing things, using language, even talking about language had already changed. He defined this term postmodernism as this historical shift that changed the way we humans live as social beings. Modernists celebrated humanism and science as a way to shine new light in the darkness. New research, new thoughts, new understandings would free humanity from the dark ages of famine and violence and plagues and propel human beings forward almost to the status of gods who could solve problems without any need for divine aid. But now, postmodernism, the new historical epic in which we now live, reflects the natural consequences of modernism gone awry. For Farley, the postmodern refers to the way institutions of leisure, buying and selling, governmental, educational, and corporate bureaucracies dominate and set the tone of everyday urban life. Alienated from what he calls the interhuman and the communities of human intimacy, these institutions are pretty much emptied of their moral, normative and aesthetic dimensions. To put it simply, the dominant forces of our culture are driven by the concern for success through profit and influence. They are not guided by a moral compass. Another scholar, Fred Craddock, described postmodernism a little bit differently. He said, postmodern means that science is chastened and humbled by its repeated defeats. The triumphalism of science is not there anymore. There's humility in its place. And as the physicist that he talked to at Princeton said to him, it's about time some of you preachers become humble also, because you're not doing so well yourself. <laughs> well, in today's world, immediate experience triumphs over tradition. The shared meta-narrative of our tradition has been exposed as a constructed truth. 
And of course, certain politicians think they have the power to reconstruct it. We find ourselves living somewhere between this unreliable view of history and a future that has lost its glimmer of hope. Here we are in the now, trying to figure out how the story of our individual lives makes sense in the muddle of this confusing world of competing narratives. Well, not everything about postmodernism is so negative. Without postmodernism, large numbers of us would still be enslaved by old dominant myths remembered and retold by people in power to maintain control over the masses. The open interrogation of cultural norms by large groups such as people of African descent, women, the disabled, members of the LGBTQ community, indigenous peoples, working classes and immigrants have all challenged those narratives question the power structures, expose the corruption of long-held beliefs and customs. Liberation is one of the positive byproducts of postmodernism. So here we are, liberated. And that liberation brings plurality, relativity instead of absolutes, and the awareness of difference. Difference between the frozen dominant ones. But there's still this lingering experience in that liberation of a void, an anxiety we experienced as dispersed, bureaucratized, isolated, and autonomous selves in society. If our cultural consciousness has no center, that holds together our stories, our values, and our beliefs, then that will affect the words that have previously been powerful for us, especially in the church. And I would add, it will affect the way we worship. Farley wrote in the early 1990s. At that time, the personal computer had been introduced in the 70s, but the World Wide Web had not been made available to the public until 1993. Farley had not yet witnessed the birth of Google in 1998, nor the iPhone in 2007, which all of this intensified the cultural shift even more. Today, then huge industries exist to create images, sell products, market those products to us, those cookies on our computers, glean information about each of us in less than a second, sell it to marketers who in turn target us with products to meet our individual needs and desires. Media produced images flash before our eyes. All kinds of polls tell us what our neighbors think about almost any subject. The celebrities, whether they're on the basketball court or reality television or in the House Intelligence Committee of Congress, fill the frames of our entertainment news. The media is relentless in flashing the same faces on screen after screen to raise our blood pressure, pique our interest, or solidify our loyalty in some way. Our senses are overwhelmed when reality is reduced to screen-sized images and sound bites. So in this kind of world, education, religion, and the arts. I thought those are three things that we're all about here at MPS. Find themselves shoved to the margins with diminished influence on business, entertainment, or even government. With the development of social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, 
the reading ability of folks in society has declined. Information from prominent officials is now shared in tweets less than 280 characters long. And the news media hangs on to every morsel of a word as if it had deep substance and meaning. The move from email to texting has wrecked our ability to spell the words that we use and has us learning to speak in emojis rather than communicating complete sentences. We connect with the world but we remain in physical isolation from it. The realm of the interhuman, where people are most vulnerable, takes second place to online presence. By now you may be thinking, wasn't this supposed to be a lecture about worship? <laughs> yes, yes it is. But it's also a lecture on changes in worship in the United States over the last 50 years. And if we're not fully cognizant of the shift in our social world during this period of time, the changes in worship will not make nearly as much sense. So where is God in this crazy, pluralistic, secularized world of dispersed and polarized people? Well, as we look at the effects of postmodernism on the world of worship in Christian churches in America, we may discover that the God of the Christian tradition has sort of changed, evolved maybe, from a cosmic creator to a lover in secret at the heart of an individualized emotional experience because the styles of worship have shifted. So as I look back, I want to focus on three major movements. First, the liturgical renewal movement of mainline Protestant churches. And then the sweep of Afro-Pentecostalism in many of our African-American churches. And finally, the Jesus People Movement that gave birth to the multi-billion dollar contemporary worship music industry. Yes, there are other styles of worship going on and being practiced during this time, but these three are examples of dominant influences that define worship life that were born out of this cultural change. The liturgical renewal movement. In the 1950s, when I was born, the church was very popular. Church membership and attendance was at its highest in American life. But in the 60s, it started experiencing a decline. And there was a rise in religious special interest groups. As with all institutions and bureaucracies, the church at the time was not exempt from the scrutiny of those who questions it questioned its claims to absolute authority or universal truth or even its unbending moral theology. Mainline Protestant churches were thought to be institutions born from and representing the traditional dominant culture, the culture under fire by a lot of new social movements. Many churches in the 60s witnessed the emergence of liturgical reform because they participated in a movement of uh, ecumenical cooperation. The Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church from 1962 to 65 had adopted new approaches to worship that were attuned to its earliest historical roots, but they seemed more relevant to modern Christian life. 
They decided to simplify their rights, develop new texts. In the case of Roman Catholicism, that meant translating the Latin text into ver the vernacular language of the people in various countries. And they re-educated both laity and clergy on their roles in liturgical celebration. It brought responsibility for worship back to the people. Well, in 1962, there was a group called the Consultation on Church Union that was created, Hoku. It began talks among dominant mainline Protestant churches in an effort to bring about consensus among the member denominations. Some church leaders had the dream of healing the fractured Protestant movement by reconciling as many denominations as possible into a larger whole. Within five years, the African Amer Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, Christian Methodist Episcopal Churches, the Episcopal Church, Evangelical United Brethren, all kinds of Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the United Church of Christ were all engaged in Koku. Well, one of the biggest challenges to church unification was the difference in theology and practice of worship, especially the various understandings of the sacraments among these various groups. So theologians followed the lead of the Second Vatican Council and turned to the earliest church documents to, uh, to set the foundation for liturgical worship. Participating churches adopt new worship practices and they produced new hymnals and new worship books in the 90s, promoting changes to worship styles across denominations. Liturgies that had once been influenced by popular revivalism or older reform traditions now sounded very much like the liturgies of Lutheran, Episcopal, Roman Catholic churches. Methodists, Presbyterians, United Church of Christ, and Disciples of Christ could move easily from one context to the other. So out of that grew the consultation on common texts, which my students know produced the revised common lectionary. And this allowed churches to follow the liturgical calendar and share scripture lessons every week. This worship style followed this four-fold order of worship, which included the gathering, proclamation, response, and dismissal. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. The proclamation of the word is positioned in the center of the service after the gathering of the community and before the celebration of sacraments, which forms the faithful into the body of Christ for the world. With multiple churches sharing a very similar approach to worship, the innovation in worship began to happen in the hymnody of the church. In 1970, the Hymn Society of America was established. And they did not only preserve the old hymns, but they promoted the writing of new ones. The works of theologians like Brian Wren and Thomas Troger, Ruth Duck, Sylvia Dunstan, Mary Louise Bringle, and Shirley Arena Murray, all produced hymns that were inclusive, socially conscious, and creative in their use of new metaphors for God and God's actions in the world. Through the publishers GIA and Hope Publishing, the number and variety of hymns grew. So these churches that invested in trained musician, music education of church members and the cultivation of new musical styles in their hymnody benefited most from the growth of hymnody during this time. But it was happening 
at the same time that the musical literacy of the general population was diminishing. And it was at a time when the church needed music education more than ever to, to succeed. So mainline churches continued to decline in membership, even with the liturgical changes. The dream of unification failed. The spiritual formation of Christian communities, which is at the heart of this liturgical renewal movement, found itself at odds with the surging individualism of the age. The stress on deep meanings related to Christian faith through word and sacraments lost ground. The simplicity of a popular form of religion based on the immediacy of experience and personal feelings of affection for God. Digital music of the age was in competition with the sound of congregational singing supported by the lungs of a pipe organ. So congregates began to vote with their feet based on personal preference and sometimes politics. And we still see fragmentation happening in mainline churches today that are now based on ideological differences under the guise of theological orthodoxy. The hymn, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love, is now an aspirational hymn rather than a hymn of affirmation in many of our denominations. Well, not all mainline churches clutched the liturgical renewal movement so closely. In fact, uh, one of these churches, uh, which I attend, First Congregational Church in Memphis, chose to be liturgical, but choose and pick elements that spoke to their congregational context and add new elements as their theological commitments changed. And so the form of worship they adopted is liturgical, but with a creative blend of elements that represents this lively pluralism that we might characterize as mashup worship. <laughs> We'll talk a little about a little more about this kind of worship on Wednesday. <clears throat> the liturgical renewal movement still grounds many mainline Protestant and Roman Catholic congregations in the richness of the historical tradition. But the experience of worship is primarily rational through participation in reading speaking and hearing an educated interpretation of scripture as the word event. In a postmodern culture that values individualism, immediacy, and experience, the practices which rely on reading comprehension, awareness of the historical context, and informed interpretation of words and signs are less attractive to people today who are motivated more by image and sound bites for their view of reality and less by literature, arts, and theology. It's not uncommon to witness an older generation of people whose consciousness was formed through, uh, through an education in the liberal arts finding meaning in this style of worship. Okay, the second movement I'd like to bring forward is the style known in some circles as Afro-Pentecostalism. You who know me know that I am white in color and less exuberant in my normal worship practices and I never learned how to dance. <laughs> So I approached the subject with fear and trembling, not as a participant immersed in the tradition, but as an observer and a scholar. I'm aware of the limits of my point of view. The movement, however, is so influential in American life that it cannot be ignored. <laughs> 
So I apologize in advance for any ways that I might be misrepresenting this important worship style. Worship styles in the Black church are varied according to denomination and leadership. With roots in the invisible institution, the worship of enslaved persons in secret, African-American traditions bear the imprint of African spiritual sensibilities and the ethos of suffering under the oppressive and violent confines of slavery in America. When African-American churches broke away from their oppressors, they were free to worship differently and, the develop, and to develop a culture of courage and resistance while assuring each person in the congregation of their true value before God. These churches brought with them the black spirituals and adaptation of traditional hymns learned in European American church services. So in her book, In Spirit and in Truth, The Music of African American Worship, Melba Coston spends a lot of time talking about gospel music and its role in the church. In urban settings, gospel music drew on the secular music of the black community because there really wasn't the distinction between sacred and secular. It combined elements of blues, ragtime, and jazz to create a musical style that had exaggerated rhythms and improvisation. Coston defines it this way, as a genre, Black gospel music is a 20th century, freely improvised musical expression of the good news in song, according to the intensity and Black music aesthetics of contemporary African-American culture. Another scholar, Pearl Williams Jones, argued that Black gospel music was a synthesis of West African and African-American music, dance, poetry, and drama. Cheryl Sanders describes it as a synthetic art form, a musical fusion of European Protestant hymnody, Negro spirituals, blues, jazz, and eventually rhythm and blues, rap, and classical music. It's a little bit of everything. Well, Afro-Pentecostal, Afro-Pentecostalism, uh, began to emerge in after 1906 with the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. Churches that adopted Afro-Pentecostalism at the time also embraced gospel music. And so they brought the sounds of ragtime and blues and jazz into the church. And they often brought the accompanying instruments, drums, tambourines, triangle, guitar, upright bass, saxophone, trumpet, trombones, and anything else that felt right in the spirit. Organs and pianos, though they were used in the quote, dignified, wealthier churches, were not shunned in the folk churches, but they usually cost more than the budget would allow. And when money was an issue, and instruments could not be purchased. Folk churches simply sang in acapella, channeling the dynamic power of the congregational voice and the rhythm of hands and feet in worship. It was the 1930s through the work of uh, people like uh, uh, Charles Kindley and Tommy Dorsey, Thomas Dorsey, excuse me, that uh, the, the uh, music, gospel music began to be spread throughout the church. It was performed regularly. Um, the Gospel Pearls was a hymnal published that brought that music to the local churches. And over time, this Black gospel music and its sensibility spread beyond the class barrier of lower class churches into a respected position within all black denominations. Well, in the 60s, where we're looking 
It, it also became popularized by people like Aretha Franklin or James Cleveland. And recording artists began to record gospel music. And people like Sam Cooke took the gospel music of the church and recorded it on secular labels. And it was marketed as soul music. So when all these major record labels like Columbia and RCA got involved, they could make money off of it. And so they generated more genres of gospel music that could be marketed to people in the popular culture. Well, gospel music has at its heart the principle of uh, improvisation. The spontaneous freedom of improvisation to change whatever song you're singing to make it new in the moment. And with improvisation comes the, the inbreaking of the spirit to create that new thing. It's this music that has helped guide the spread of Afro-Pentecostalism in the black church as well. It, this theology incorporates an expanded pneumatology and a distinctive appreciation for the operation of the gifts of the spirit in the life of the individual. So it, this, this theology has entered many classically black denominations including large segments of the African Methodist Episcopal and other churches. Staying within their original denominational context, some black churches have incorporated this style without making major changes to the theology of their worship. So that today there's little noticeable difference in the worship styles of most contemporary African-American congregations, regardless of which denomination they are involved. The diversity within Afro-Pentecostalism reflects this changing dynamic of the North American context. The emerging black middle class that arose after the civil rights movement has transformed this, the shape of this Afro-Pentecostalism. You have megachurch pastors like T.D. Jakes or Charles Blake or Tony Evans that televise forms of Afro-Pentecostalism across the continent and around the world over the internet and on streaming channels with the results that very few folks are uninformed about this form of Pentecostal life. In these churches, these large churches, professional worship teams now provide oversight to the ecstasy that's experienced within the congregation. But within the structure of worship, the prophetic tradition of the black church can still offer its critique of oppression and evil. So <clears throat> in his study on the development of Africa, uh, American Pentecostalism, the historian, Dr. Grant Wacker, suggests that Pentecostal worship oscillates between anti-structural and structural impulses. He calls this phenomenon planned spontaneity. Spontaneity is considered a sign of authenticity in worship, arising from a direct connection to God. So underneath that spontaneity, you have singing and testimonies and prayers and sermons and calls to the altar. And that they usually stay in a predictable sequence. But music becomes the device used to regulate the spontaneity of the service. Wacker says that with music, Leaders can ratchet up the tempo until worshipers break into an ecstatic praise, or music can tone it down when things seems to be, seem to be getting out of hand. Music gives leaders a ready means of managing the intensity of the service and regularizing the expression of emotion. Dr. Cheryl Sanders supports this observation 
that Pentecostalism has fixed and fluid forms as the as one of the quintessentially ecstatic expressions of worship, the shout or the holy dance is a perfect example, she writes. It appears as a spontaneous eruption into a coordinated choreographed movement with characteristic steps, motions, rhythms, and syncopations. It's not some wild random expression of kinetic energy. The expression of ecstasy and worship has its own culturally and aesthetically recognizable form. So for Afro-Pentecostalism, authentic, authentic, I can say it, authenticity in worship is experiential. An immediate encounter with God that evokes spontaneity of emotion or some ecstatic action within an orderly plan of service. The singer improvises a song, the choir and congregation respond, and the congregation recognizes that the spontaneity is a sign of authenticity in worship. But this, this fostering of spiritual ecstasy is not simply an exercise for the sole benefit of the individual. It helps to create a social space that allows a whole group of people to experience intense feelings of social togetherness, equity, and belonging as people take part in these specialized rituals. They say it's much like the experience of going to a rock concert. The community constructs through its worship these liminal moments where participants may lose awareness of social distinctions that they normally carry every day and enter a leveled social space of mutual equality. So this goal of immediate encounter with God that is shared by those who gather in worship can translate into a self-forgetfulness in which the confusion and anxiety of the fragmented self finds relief for a moment within the safety of a well-orchestrated style of worship. Now let's go to the Jesus People Movement of the 1970s. It signaled a countercultural shift in American Christianity. This movement has a significant influence on people because it aligns well with the values of postmodernism. So go back with me for a second to the Second Vatican Council. Remember that? In the 60s, after that, the Roman Catholic Church was the first to begin the experiment of using not just language in the vernacular of the people, but to change the language of music into the vernacular of the people. They began with the folk mass, bringing folk songs and folk music into the church for the first time. Well, the rise of the Jesus People movement in the early 1970s gave birth in a similar way to the adoption of rock music in churches. Church leaders like Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California, used the music of Woodstock in worship as a way to speak to and draw in the young hippies that roamed the California coast. In Christian coffee shops and evening Bible studies, the youth of the counterculture became Christians, joined churches like Calvary Chapel, and brought their guitars with them. At first, the songs were sung in coffee houses, and they were often little commercial ditties or secular rock tunes infused with new Jesus lyrics. But soon the community encouraged young Christians to write music that reflected their own, quote, authentic experience of God. 
These new songs brought freshness to worship, a freshness that fed their belief that God was speaking a new message to the world through this music. Calvary Chapel embraced the mu music of the 1960s as this translation tool. But by the 1980s, denominations like Vineyard Fellowship incorporated rock music into their worship, not simply to attract worshipers, but because they recognized its power to move worshipers emotionally. Led by John Wimber, the Vineyard Fellowship split off from the Calvary Chapel Network because they, unlike Calvary Chapel folks, embraced the gifts of the Spirit, Pentecostalism, which in turn shaped the sound of their worship music. The music of Vineyard Fellowship was at first spontaneous and improvisational. Songs had no set ending and they could be adapted to respond to the energy of the congregation and the cadence of the pastor. But soon, Vineyard Fellowship created this new music that reflected their theological uh, values geared specifically toward experiential worship. The music had simple melodies and instru simple instrumentation. The simpler the song, the easier it would be to sing. So the style of music left few barriers to ordinary singers participation in worship. Through the influence of these churches, worship became synonymous with music. The music carried a certain emotional resonance to awaken the heart. The songs were intentionally focused on creating an almost romantic relationship between the worshiper and God. The Vineyard Networks developed a soft rock repertoire of, quote, love songs to God, to guide and dictate the emotional setting. You've heard this style of song. God is always addressed directly rather than being feared or revered from afar. The singer expresses their love from heartfelt emotions, either in the first person singular or plural. Most praise songs simplify the words of scripture into singable phrases. So in the late 80s and 90s, the church growth movement under Donald McGavran and Peter Wagner at Fuller Theological Seminary decided to embrace this style of worship music as the pillar of the seeker-sensitive strategies to attract baby boomers and their children into churches. Churches then like Willow Creek Community Church in suburban Chicago or Saddleback Church in Orange County led the way in using contemporary styles of worship, but hundreds of other churches eventually did the same. For church growth specialists, pragmatism shaped the choice of worship styles. And that pragmatic choice was what will increase church attendance. Rock music provided the results in droves. As church pastor William Eason argued in 1993, his book, Dancing with Dinosaurs, that culturally relevant music was required for churches to grow. So whatever the motivation, rock and roll became the most popular resource for American evangelical churches. By the 1990s, contemporary worship music had evolved into a huge industry built around this merger between contemporary music and worship. Worship music publishers and record labels like Maranatha Music or Vineyard Music and Integrity Music saw growth in record sales. And when they did, established record producers formed or bought smaller imprints and focused on cultivating and distributing contemporary worship music. Then came the Christian Copyright Licensing Incorporated that became the catalyst for this new market by building a licensing structure. For an annual fee, CCLI licensed churches 
to use popular contemporary worship songs in their services, print the words in their bulletins, or put the songs up on their projection screens. As for the music, what had begun as simple folk ditties written for acoustic guitar, developed into fully orchestrated rock anthems replete with synced stage lighting, industrial fog machines, and thousands of rock fans turned worshipers with hands lifted to God and a stage. The transformation of search church sanctuary to rock arena approached the height of its popularity in the early 2000s at Hillsong Church in Sydney, Australia, and the rock concert setting at Passion Conferences in the United States. Hillsong's Shout to the Lord became an anthem that stayed on CCLI's top 25 chart for 14 years in a row. The Passion Conferences provided a stage for talented worship artists to lead thousands of young Americans in worship via CDs or regional concerts and an annual worship conference that drew 60,000 people in 2013. 50 years after some hard shell evangelicals had declared that rock and roll was not in line with the word of God, Rock music was a permanent fixture in American church life. It was adopted as a tool to win people for Christ, but it was equally fueled by a desire in people for more experiential and emotional connection with God in worship. And as musicologists and cultural studies scholars have long shown, rock music was inherently affective in an emotionally charged form of music that communicated feeling through its lyrical poetry and musical sound. Now, modern media technologies like radio and television broadcasting influenced worship for many years in the 20th century, but it was the projector that really brought contemporary worship into the sanctuaries of churches. The flood of new songs exceeded the ability of denominational committees to develop new hymnals. And as such, the projector filled in where published books were too slow to respond. The projection of words on screens also democratized song selection and curation. And when digital projectors came at a price that churches could afford, the local congregation then could connect a computer and display any format of typed document. With the advent of the internet, ensuring documents around the world became a real reality, a re real-time possibility. So with the easy availability of advanced audiovisual technologies, more churches can now afford to bring projected images and words into their sanctuaries for worship. Starting in the 1990s and picking up speed in the 2000s, mega churches with large sanctuaries borrowed a technique from large professional entertainment venues and began transferring the faces and bodies of the people leading worship on stage onto a big screen. The pastor and musicians could now be seen clearly, which solved the problem for those sitting on the back row of a giant auditorium. But the projection of these leaders on the stage had other effects as well. It amplified the power of the worship leader to influence emotional response. It basically made them rock stars. And as they became more visible, big visible people on the screen. They had to learn to communicate through the screen. Mega churches hired video production specialists, which changed the purpose of media from documentation of what was happening in worship to creative specialized cinematic production. The combination of visual choreography, the splicing of different video feeds from different vantage points, and the addition of real-time digital effects 
created a cinematic experience that further moves the listener into a space of intense emotional energy. All of these uh, changes and bringing of new technologies into worship and the worship music has been framed by some scholars as the Pentecostalization of American Christianity. Because in these worship styles, you can see the bod bodily liturgies, the swaying, the raising of hands, the open palms, the intimate informal lyrics that directly connect the worshiper with God, and the emotionality of the music. Some say it's not necessarily a bad thing. Some say we recognize truth through our emotions. And certainly uh, we have people who are searching for truth in worship. <clears throat> Believers of all kinds today embrace contemporary worship as authentic because the emotions they feel reflect some feeling of personal authentic authenticity derived in the present moment. I really don't have time to talk about how the, these changes in worship influence the changes in preaching, though I'd love to, I don't have time, but, <clears throat> All of this is to say that the one, this one lecture could never address all of the changes to worship in the United States. None of what you've heard tonight is really anything new. It's just a reminder that this is where we've come through the changes of our culture. What we have seen is a changing understanding and experience of worship that's brought about by a rapidly changing postmodern culture. The shift away from knowledge about God to the immediate experience of God is central to all of the changes that have been highlighted. The society in which we live is increasingly fragmented, polarized, and radicalized by the proliferation of communication and information technologies. Ordinary people are subject to multiple messages and endless choices each and every day. Screen time gives us the illusion of intimate connection with people far away as the other side of the planet. But those intimate connections cannot feed our hunger for true interhuman connection with the other, nor can it bind our wounds when we need help. No wonder we live among a people who long for some immediate emotional connection with the Holy One. No wonder people whose social skills are diminishing because of their growing isolation from others long for a safe place where they can feel something, hopefully a deep love that will relieve them of their sense of confusion and loss. None of these worship styles truly offer a panacea to all the ills we face in our war-torn fragmented world. They can't reform the church into a powerhouse of public influence, but instead they remind people to live from their hearts and not just react to their screens. In moments of immediate emotional experience and community, people may sometimes cross over into that liminality that removes them, removes from them the barriers of prejudice and pain gender and class through a moment of self-forgetfulness in worship. The moment may be transitory, but it does produce hope. 
hope that as humans, we still matter to God. This is the foundation from which we will then move to talk about what does the future hold for the church? What does the future of worship look like uh, as we look ahead for the next 10 or 20 years? So I hope this is a helpful foundation. Okay, so um, I have 8.32, so we're past the hour already, but maybe about five minutes of questions, if anybody wants to do that. And so don't do a long preamble. <laughs> Ask the question if there are any of those. Or comments. Or comments, Dr. Hudson said. So my question would be, uh, given what you said, it would seem to me that the driving force is that we have defined success in church by numbers. Am I correct? In, in, in other words, choosing this form or that form, you kept talking about drawing more people in. And so have, has the church defined Successful worship is that which draws more people in, or is there more to it than that? I would I would not say that all three of these worship styles define success in worship that way. Okay. Um, instead, there are certain people who do the uh, judge success by numbers. That's for sure, and. Certainly the way the institutional church has developed as a, an institution, we are in a position now of um, trying to figure out if we don't have the numbers of people in the pews, what are we going to do with these dinosaurs of buildings? And also, how do we uh, have influence over anyone if we don't have numbers? So. Um, I think that that there is always that lurking question. Uh, we want more people, but that does not necessarily uh, measure success in any of, I mean, in the, the two worship styles, first two worship styles that I really uh, talked about, in that um, there are lots of very small churches that practice these worship styles. Okay. Preston, were you here? My sister, by the way, goes, my sister's family goes to Passion Church in Atlanta, so mm -hmm. I was uh, curious about those comments. Mm -hmm. So now go ahead. So, similar, I mean, I'm wondering about, I mean, there's been so much attention to the trend of disaffiliation um, among black churches, mainline Protestant churches, evangelical churches, and those who do attend, attend less frequently. I'm wondering um, if how these trends in worship that you talked about might relate to disaffiliation. Do you think there's a connection that that they, these worship styles are no longer doing for people what they first set out to do? How those two trends might be related? Hmm. That's a good, good question. Uh, I think that uh, for me, disaffiliation represents further fragmentation of society by the culture. Uh, that we, we, we prefer uh, to, uh, to choose and shape our own identities. And the disaffiliation means that if you're non-denominational, um, you don't have to follow somebody else's lead. You can do what feels right for you. And um, 
So that's not a great answer to your question. I think um, on Wednesday we're going to deal with some of that, though. The, the trends uh, that are happening now where people are looking for small groups uh, to associate with, whether it's online or in person, and needing to find social groups to help um, help them understand themselves and feel a sense of belonging somewhere. Um, so we may touch on that some in the next lecture as we think forward. Thanks for the question. All right, maybe one minute. If somebody's got a short, quick, easy, she can answer in five words. <laughs> go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I guess the kind of question what I would like to ask about the sense of individuality versus sense of community. Because God's called us to community. How are we to address the individuality with the call to community that Christ claims in, in, this, in this culture? I guess that's the ultimate question. I don't know. I'm chewing it. Mm -hmm. It is. A good question of a question of faith, and I'm hoping to address that on Wednesday. That's that's sort of where I'm going uh, with this. That the way the church is going now, and how it has followed the the trends in culture, it's leaving people um, vulnerable without us. With, they're vulnerable because they have a fragmented sense of themselves and they don't have a sense of strong community where they are, they matter. And so as churches who are following in the way of Jesus, uh, we need to think about how community happens. The, the thing that happened to me in this study is it helped me understand these other styles of worship and how people who go and, and participate in those may actually feel that they have become one with a large group, larger group, and have this sense of strong community even in this individualistic worship. And that, that has helped me some with that, understand that. But I'm not sure it's conveying the deeper message of the Christian faith.